Robert R. Carpenter or Bob Carpenter, and I go by the nickname of Carp. Well, I volunteered, believe it or not, twice. Okay. <laughs> 65 for Da Nang, enjoyed the mission, came back and uh, volunteered again, went back to Saigon and then out to college. I graduated from high school, I became a typesetter apprentice. And I thought, there's more to life than this. <laughs> So uh, I went down to see, a see when the recruiters come into my little podunk town of Coshocton, Ohio, and uh, got in there and Air Force is the only one that answered the door because they was playing high stakes poker inside. <laughs> so I got with him and next thing, uh, everything worked out. I got in the Air Force and I flew to San Antonio, got my training. Uh, I got through the basic uh, training and then uh, we took our tests and everything, and they said, you did pretty good in them in there. We're going to put you in intelligence. So I thought, well, what am I going to do? Well, we can't tell you. <laughs> you know? So uh, that took uh, about 10 months. It's quite a long course. Then I went to Crete, Greece for a year and a half. I was an intelligence analyst, and uh, we worked with what's called comment or communications intelligence, and also uh, well, electronic intelligence, uh, you know, different kinds of things like that. Uh, we actually work for NSA. We just wore a uniform to get their information. Came back to San Antonio after Crete, uh, put me in the most boring job uh, that lasted less than an hour. And uh, I said, no, nah, this is not me. I got to do something. So I went up the chain of command and bingo. I said, yeah, we need you in Vietnam. So we went over there on a pilot project. It was an awesome mission and then uh, rotated back to the same office in San Antonio at headquarters. <laughs> I went up the chain of command again and decided I want to go uh, back to Nam. And they said, okay, we got a brand new operation over there. Uh, this is flight time now. And that's what I did until I got out and went to college. It was quite a long flight, both of them. And then we got into Saigon. Well, the first time we got into Da Nang, and uh, that was a thrill because as we came in, uh, we were looking down and said, oh, look at all the fire trucks. They're just running all over the place to us there. And then next thing you know, whew, our aircraft goes up and aborts like this and then more fire trucks come out. And then the captain gets so and said, our landing gear, one of them didn't go down. Prepare for a uh, crash landing. <laughs> Welcome to Vietnam. <laughs> so, uh, that, well, as they were flying around up above and dumping fuel, uh, one of the guys ran down the middle of the aisle and they opened up a plate in the middle of the floor and hand screwed, unscrewed the uh, landing gear to go down. Thank God. <laughs> so it was just like, whoa. And the first man that w came up here was our uh, sergeant who I had, he ran all of our operations in Crete, Greece. And what a nice friendly face, <laughs> you know, to see after this, you know. Uh, that first group, there was about 15 of us. And uh, then we worked into this situation and enjoyed it. It's amazing when, you, when you, you've been in Nam and most people, you, know, you look at the negative stuff and the bad stuff, you tend to forget that. I can tell you the most funniest stories in the world out of a war zone. I mean, but there are those in the trenches. I wasn't in the trenches. We were pampered pretty good, but it's just the idea there was still bombs going off and things coming at us and missiles. There is a special stench, and I'll leave it at that, in almost all of Vietnam. Remember, it was dominated, colonialized uh, by the French. And they have what they call binjo ditches. That's the sewers. They're wide open, it's just concrete Vs, and they just back up over and dump in it or pee in it. And, uh, that's, and then when the rains come, that washes it out to the sea or into a lake. And that smell, you will never forget, believe me. When, when I went back uh, about four years ago to Saigon with my wife on a cruise, uh, we went to Saigon, went downtown, and I said, now I'm preparing her for this of the smell. There was no binge ditches. They put a cement slab over them, but they piped it all out into these lakes. And it was, you know, as we get drove by it, that stench hit me again. You never forget a smell. Uh, let me go back to this too. Every country that we travel a lot around the world and things, but Crete, Greece was one of them. When you're in Greece, there's specific odors to that country. If you go to Rome, if you go to France, every country has its smell. 
And I don't mean uh, um, you know, awful smells, just there's a characteristic smell of them. And Da Nang uh, was pretty bad. Uh, Saigon at that time, not as bad because they had some sewers back then. We had three semi, van, the vans, the big long semi uh, trailers, and uh, we were uh, top secret, code word green. That's how the high the clearance we got. And uh, we did programs back then that people say, oh, uh, your drones are the newest thing in the service. Now that was 1965 and things were pretty hush hush, especially what we did. And these drones would be programmed in the morning. They'd be hitched on to underneath the wing of a C-130. We had two drones, two types of drones. One was strictly photographic that we wanted back at the base. The other one, we wanted to get shot down. I'll explain. <laughs> the first one, well, they would go up and launch it and we would go into our operations. I'm the analyst, I got my headsets on, I got my operators and we're, we're tracking that. And then when it, when it releases the drone and, and, and heads off to over Hanoi, we took a lot of pictures of the Hanoi Hilton, all the activities there. And when they came back, and these were all programmed at that time by, by a major. You know, he's sitting in there at about, about five o'clock in the morning and he's programming it. When those aircraft, uh, the drones would come back, they'd come up over the base and my radio operators are copying every, tr uh, copying every track around Hanoi to, you know, over China, you know, places we weren't allowed, <laughs> you know, this kind of thing. But when they came back to the base, the engine shuts off right above and sometimes if we had the chance, we'd run out and look up in the sky. And then a jolly green uh, chopper, big one, would come by with a big tail hook out of it. And he'd come by because that drone then would pop a chute and it'd just start coming down. And that thing would snag it, pull it in, bring it in. It would come back to us and take out the cameras and do what it needs to be done real time. And then the rest of it was boom, back to NSA. Uh, that was fun. There was other missions that we did. By the way, we were calling out these plots on the second one. It's the ones that we uh, wanted to get shot down because that gives us, with the technology that we had and, and our guys, uh, radio operators, uh, it goes up and we want to know, you know, the VC or the, you know, the different divisions and stuff that's out in the jungles and there's the canopy and everything over it. So when we would fly those, uh, if they sent up SAMs or the you know, surface to air missiles to try and shoot it down or be our guest, shoot it down because we've got all this radar, we got aircraft around like this, and we do what we call DFing, direction finding. And as soon as they launch, boom, boom, and three directions come in at pinpoint, and out here we got fi fighters flying around, go in and take out a SAM site. It was, that was the beginnings of, you know, we were so far beyond what we had then. Uh, when we had aircraft that would, um, well, you know, you're, uh, let's put it this way. Satellites were just getting into this thing. And we had some over there or up along before you had them over here, the weather satellites. And we had programmed aircraft fighters, bombers, and they, they had a target, let's say it was outside of Hanoi that made uh, munitions or, or whatever. The aircraft would, uh, would drone would fly over and give us all this stuff and then we take Air, aircraft will be flying up above like this, ready to sh do what they're going to do. Now, if they've got a bombing site that they want, like that munitions factory, but it's socked in, the clouds, you know, they can't, we can't see down there what's happening. So they looked at the clouds and saw, you know, there's always an opening in the clouds, a little blue patch, you know. Oh, boom, we'd lock onto that and follow it. And then the fighters could go in and, or the bombers could go in and drop their bombs on it. Very sophisticated. We sat back comfortably in these trailers passing on this information. We also did, uh, uh, I'll, I'll get to that in Saigon, that was uh, more sophistication, but uh, it was such a challenge and the job was phenomenal. Because you know, you saved a lot of lives out there uh, in the technology that we had because th this was the start of a new program. It was very interesting, very interesting. I came back, three months is about as much as I could take of doing. When I came back to uh, Kelly Air Base then, and. Uh, Air Force head, Intelligence is headquartered down there. And they stuck me in this room, all by my, I had my whole office. 
And all I had to do was log in every Soviet aircraft that landed in Cuba. Oh, <laughs> we, you know, we knew what kind of uh, bombs and sophisticated radars, especially, you know, it all, you could just write it all down to pe pencil. Then somebody back then, they transcribe it to one of the IBM cards, every single plot. And then it would go downstairs, it was underneath our building was the size of a football field. It was that big of a thing. Uh, and had the first of the big IBM computers with the di giant disks on it. And it would crank out every blip on the scope. And we did that from things all over the world, every, you know, like Russia, things that we were, you know, against there. That was um, 65. I got in it uh, in 63. I remember I spent a year and a half in Crete. Crete was really interesting. Well, we'll get back to that, but uh, I got a commendation medal over there for uh, breaking a code uh, as we were trained and translating. I became a, uh, well, I won't mention the country. <laughs> um, they said, you're gonna work this. And I said, well, I'm, I'm a trained Soviet analyst. Why am I going, what am I doing down here? So they said, no, you're gonna do this. I said, okay. Well, what does it say? We don't know, we just sent it back to Washington. I said, well, I'm going to do this for a year and a half and not know what's going on. So I went out on the market and bought me two books of a known country in the Middle East. Uh, and I became a half-assed, if you would, <laughs> excuse the term, uh, analyst, I mean a, a linguist, because they had none. All right. Uh, I got this, uh, my radio operator said, Something, something's weird here. It was, well, it came through my clandestine, clandestine network. And uh, so I, it was just a short message. So I did my thing and uh, holy cow, there was a bomb that planted at the American embassy in X country. So we sent it out as a critic, we did many critics. It goes, knocks out every bit of communication as it was then, goes right to the president, right to the Pentagon and everything stops, you know. They got the guys, the, the uh, ambassador and everybody out of the building. And just after that, the building blew. And all, and they, generals flew in. I got a commendation medal from the State Department, all this stuff. But the paperwork, they never released because of the sensitivity of it. It's, yeah, you got a commendation medal, end of story. <laughs> so uh, it was about several years ago. You know, the internet was coming up and everything. They never, and I said, they don't tell you the rest of the story. So I looked it up. And it was declassified through the British government because they owned this territory, this place, while they had dealings there. And they released it. And I'm sitting there reading all this because of intercept, blah, 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 you know, that kind of thing. And uh, apparently they brought a bomb in a truck and parked it. And the, the ambassador lived on the second floor, but it was a parking space underneath his bedroom. And they, some guys brought this truck in, put it in, and had a timer on it, and, you know, or what, I don't know how that part of it, but it blew up. And they, uh, so we say, not the building, but buildings are expendable, but all the people in there. So that was one of my greatest ventures. And then I had one in Vietnam too. So I went to Saigon, Tonsonut Air Base was my uh, second uh, time over there. Learned, this was brand new. We had, uh, trying to use the words here, these were old C-47s, Goonies. And the Army had uh, about 27 of them. We had like 31 of them. They were taken out of the, you know, these uh, places where they, the graveyards and every place they could get them in there and made them into EC-47s. So I got there right at the beginning of it and that was, the timing was perfect. They, um, we worked with the Army and the Army been over there quite, quite a lot longer so I had to clear in with my badge every morning through Army intelligence and then out the back door. And then we had two more, tra we had two trailer vans out there. We would go down, uh, we, we tracked, uh, well, we did electronic communications, getting communications intelligence back. Uh, and but the main thing on them was the kind of ARDF, direction finding of any signal, anything out there. And we had, you know, the same thing, aircraft flying around. And I'd seen the reports on it uh, that had been made public in there. And the, the commanders over there after this mission started, and then, of course, it's not there now, but um, 
that 82% of the information that we relayed to the B-52 commanders was accurate. And uh, we pride ourselves on that, believe me. And then they gave me a, I'm not a weapons person. <laughs> you know, I mean, you can go in the service, you don't have to like them, you know. Uh, they gave me a sidearm, I had a 45. The first thing is, do uh, you ever wear a jumpsuit or a flight suit? They're awful. And I just wore my fatigues. And they said, well, there's no law against it. Go ahead and wear them if you want them. So I'm, I'm in fatigues. I got my gun strapped. I'm walking down. I feel like I'm paladin walking to operations. But I had to go in our operations first. And the first time I did this, uh, we had top secret code word material, all this stuff in there. And I said, well, it takes an officer. Who's going to take it down there? I'm not an officer. Put it in your shirt. I said, you know, it's like that. I was only following orders, <laughs> you know, that stuff. Mm -hmm. Had a gun, had other stuff on you in case you got shot down. Uh, well, the CIA gave it to us. Um, it was just things, you know. So we flew those missions and uh, they were wonderful. Uh, they, we'd leave the back door, they'd left the back door open. Now I'm walking around with my headsets on and I got 12 radio operators and direction finding people, all this stuff here. When we got on board, the first thing we did, I'd go up and lock the captain and the co-pilot in. They had no right to know what was happening back here. It was pretty sophisticated. And uh, I mean, we had good times and bad times, but I meant that this one was good. So when they come back on the land or when they landed, then we uh, unlock them, say, come on out. You know, they didn't know. And I would get on headsets. And I know, we know we wanted to get to X thing out there. Uh, I give them the coordinates. You know, on a headset, call them in. That's all their job was, to fly around for about eight hours, 12 hours a time, and just do their thing, go where I wanted. That back door, uh, every once in a while, if we had a lull time in there, we had these Chuhoi tickets. I, this is something that they dropped them out of aircraft. And if a Vietnamese, the communist Vietnamese down there, if he picked it up, it was a free pass to freedom. And he would be taken away, you know, and given a, a new, well. And we would dump these uh, Chuhoi tickets out. Any Vietnam person knows what, if they've been there. You haven't, but I wouldn't know the things that, that you know over there. And then uh, one day we were, I got a call on, uh, on my headsets, and it was from command. And they said, uh, we need you to tell the captains and stuff to get out of that area. Here's the coordinates that you're heading for. So I called them and, and uh, they were a, a night raid B-52s coming in at their altitude, you know. And we're, we can't go anything lower than 2,000 feet. So, I mean, so we stayed, you know, above that. So we're just flying along and I went back to the back door to look out because they just kept it off to dump things out. We're flying along and then all of a sudden look out and right down here, you know, out the back door looking down, all the ground just lit up from the B-52 where the bombs went down. So I called the captain up front and I said, uh, what the hell is going on? I said, I gave you the coordinates that we weren't supposed to be in. And I gave them to him there and he said, I wrote it down wrong. <laughs> So we could hear them, the whistling of hundreds of those big 500 pounders or whatever they were. And I have never in my life, I got goosebumps now talking about it. I haven't talked about it in years, but decades. Boom, but boom, but boom, but boom, and then just blang, blang, blang. Next thing you hear the giant swimming pool for the next day, you know, you see things up there. There were so many things like that that, uh, that we'd done. And you knew you were doing it for good. The worst thing, oh, there's two of them that are the worst things. And I say I talk about most of the good things. When we got down to the ground and then we'd make up reports out in those trailers with other guys and then had to courier them down to MACV headquarters. That's where Westmoreland was in downtown Saigon. And they said, uh, well, we don't have a courier, a carp, uh, you take them down. I go out and I go, it's top secret code word stuff. I can't do that. Yeah, how you do that? Down your shirt. And I said, well, how am I going to get in town? Oh, just get on one of the Sicolos, uh, little petty cabs, you know, and get down there and give them the documents, take them out and come back. And you knew 
that a lot of that intelligence that we had collected that night or the, you know, just almost a well, then it, that was real time, you know, because the South Vietnamese officers set into the same meetings as American officers. And you know that the leaks in there were phenomenal, that they were working, they were dual agents, if you will, or dual positions, you know, for communists and for their. And some of that information that we had collected, we knew specifically, and those guys would get slaughtered down there. That hurt, you know, it still does. And then uh, my barracks, two story, it was kind of nice. <laughs> but next to us was the worst thing in my life. I quiver when I talk about it, that I've ever seen. At nighttime, they would fly in the bodies, the pieces, and the morgue for all of Vietnam was the next building down. I had to walk by that in the morning and walk by it at night uh, to get to our, our trailers or to our operations. I have never seen, they bring the bodies in and it was a three-sided building. On the front, they had a tarp and just pull this long tarp back. Inside were concrete sloped like this with drains on them. There may be, I'm guessing sometimes a hundred bodies in there and really bad. They bring them in, take them out of the body bags and bring out like, it was like a fire hose and hose them down. No, no clothing. I mean, they're just new bodies and stuff. And they come out in the stretcher, put the bodies on, take them inside. They shave all the hair off the entire body, as I was told. So, you can never be assigned to the mortuary in the military. You volunteer. Most of those guys now run funeral homes. <laughs> but I meant good business for them to learn this trade. Once they would do that, uh, they put this, it was like mesh. You know how they put vegetables and things in the, I, This may, I don't even know if you'd want to go this way, but it, it's from the heart. They'd mesh them, put that mesh on them if they were blown apart and then put them in aluminum coffins. Just bring them in. And I stood there and watched a few, several times. <laughs> the interest in that, well, that's what it was. It got interest, but it was scary, you know. They put them in, close them up, and then they'd bring them out right across the street, open the gate, and inside they put a wooden pallet down. Three, 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 nine pallets, that ribbon rope across them and just sit them out there in a hot sun in the runway or at the edge of the runway and who first available going back to the United States would be lifted in, straight in and go. I saw that so many times. I went out in the jungle, you know, the jungle came to me, <laughs> if you want to say that. I didn't mean to get on that stuff, but uh, it's an aspect of a true war. And then across the street, and I even took pictures of it because I have the Agent Orange problem. So, a few things, heart stuff. But right across the street, when I got, it took me seven months or seven, seven years to get my Agent Orange through the VA. And I've been there twice. I went out of the jungle. That stuff was, you know, mauler than life. Right across from my, from where I slept, my bunk, just up above and down. And you can just look right out the slats in the window and across the street was the Agent Orange dispensary for the whole country. C-123s, choppers coming in. And I was fascinated to watch. I didn't know a thing about it then. The gra they had PF, uh, PS, perforated steel plank, PSP, those long steel things with the holes in them where they keep the, you know, some vehicle, they probably even still use them over in, uh, in the rack and stuff. Just looking out there, and that ground was pure orange. And uh, the guys, the Air Force guys, had uh, well, they had goggles on and gloves, and their uniform. And some of them, well, they had a bib like thing, big one down like this, and it was all this orange on them. They would get up on the wing of an aircraft or inside where they had the big tubs and hand pump it out of a 55-gallon drum. 
and it would spill and all this stuff on it. Those guys can't, they couldn't even have been alive 20 years later. Though I mean, that was really into the color, the, the color orange. You see that word about the orange. And I watched that and I didn't have no idea what the impact of, of that was going to be. And I took pictures of it. And when I came back to try and get my, uh, every VA doctor, that same one, it was a Filipino doctor, and I kept asking him for my annual physical. I said, what do you, um, what should I do about Agent Orange? Been there twice and all this stuff. He said, too much paperwork, forget it. The last one I had came to me, or when I went to him, and he come run out of the office. He said, I just read your, your medical records. Said, Why haven't you filed for Agent Orange? <laughs> he speeded it through and <laughs> got it. I haven't, you know, I get compens I don't care about the compensation, but you know, now, Think of how many people were sprayed over there. Well, and you know, it. I, I don't, I can't count them. I wasn't out there and I don't give any pretense. Now, as I said, we jumped from the second floor down into the bunkers, uh, from missiles come in. Uh, that was for, uh, you know, it was a different kind of situation, but I could perish just as well as anybody else. We had, uh, since we had so many of these aircraft, it was 6994th Security Squadron, they call it, and the 390th uh, Reconnaissance for Army. <coughs> Those uh, aircraft, we lost three of them on the ground. And they were just parked like this and like this, and right next to us, Air America. It seems like every alcoholic and that's been a pilot becomes an Air America pilot. <laughs> and there's good money. and the stuff that they do. Three different occasions when I was there, they came in, were drunk at the wheel, if you will, and made a wide turn and destroyed our aircraft, cut the wings off of them, engines, the whole nose of the cockpit of one of them, the got off three times. And they never do anything with the Air America guy. If I'd have done that, I'd be in <laughs> prison probably. But when I did get out, my mom and dad lived eight miles away from beautiful, quiet Kent State. So I decided uh, I didn't want to stay in. I'll, I'll get my degree. So I got out, enrolled as a freshman. I was 23. I'm, my mind is working. I'm sitting next to a 17-year-old. I'm so older. Not that I'm any smarter, but I'm so older. You know, and, I, and so I go to Kent State. My degree is in broadcasting. And uh, I was there almost a full quarter, and they came to me and said, we like your work. How would you like to be news director, WKSU? And I said, well, sounds good to me, because that's what I came here for. So uh, I did that. I get out of that. I had radio talk shows and all these things. But when it came that most people know, Kent State is the shootings. And I was a, a newsman. I had my tape recorder always on my side. And it had the little cord, you didn't have <laughs> electronic, just a little cord and just a little push button on it. So uh, I'd been clubbed, tear gas, shot at, all the things that happened, you know, um, probably 25 riots I covered in Kent, even years before and, and after. I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. Um, there's five boxes that big. I was a pack rat. I saved everything on Kent State, everything. Uh, pamphlets of the writings of it. Uh, and they all went in the, I donated in the Kent State Archives. Uh, so I've got, and I was supposed to, every five years they'd send me back and I was a relic old man speaker. And this year, 50 years, 50 years passed. And I was to go back up uh, and it was canceled because, uh, because of the COVID. But I've been around, I've seen all oh, my talk shows. I, uh, twice they broke into my radio station because they didn't like what I said. Nobody challenged the SDS, Students for Democratic Society. Nobody challenged the program. I did. I was another voice there. I may, and I'm not, I'm proud of what I did, but they, um, all, all of these, uh, the media would pick up on it and things because when I talked to them on my radio show, I knew I had been to NOM twice. So I, and people started listening to me. Not that I like war uh, or anything. I did my job in that war. There were many things, as we found out later, that were just wrong. I did my job. But they, 
broke that, the cops said, I called the cops, you know, and it was on third floor in the uh, control room, and they said, lock yourself in. Well, the leaders of the SDS, the top four, anyways, they went to jail for six months because of me and some other charges that was against them right there. I was the only one that went to see them. I thought I was a good newsman, and I always did. I gave ballast. If I gave a statement from the mayor of uh, Kent that was so against, you know, blah, 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 I'd go out and talk to one of the radicals. They would talk to me because they was their only outlet. And that's the way news, and I have always done news, uh, you know, and then I became PIO of the Sheriff's Department. That was the most fun 10 years I ever had here with Charlotte County Sheriff. I don't think there's anybody here from the grandchildren on up at this time or have over, over time that hasn't heard daddy, grandpa, and that sounds sexist, but women were not that well known in the military, but now they are. When I was in intelligence, there wasn't one woman allowed in the intelligence department. They started coming in and became the best analysts, the best crypto people, because they pay attention to detail. I'm just a little weird, I paid attention to detail. That's what that history has to carry on. And there is such an impact on this world of what happened and changed. Uh, Vietnam was one of the worst things. I have, first time I came back, I was a hero. Next time I come back from Saigon, I was one of those that was spit on because we got off at San Francisco International. They were up on a roof and throwing stuff at us. People got to remember what can happen. Riots, war, all those things have to be remembered. And this thing here, this was the old Irwin building, and I back in here many years ago with that. They have done one of the most finest things in the world of putting this collection together. Because right now, World War I, I don't even know if there's a vet left in this county. World War II are almost gone. I'm next. I'm 77. And us Vietnam veterans are starting to drop. As, well, there won't be any World War II. Then there won't be any of us. But it's got to carry on. One thing we'll always have, we'll have war. God knows I, who wants it, there will be war. And we just carry on the things here. Most of us look around, honor, in honor of what these people stood for, the men and women that lost their lives, what they did, what they had, uh, needs to be on display. When the kids come through, that's great. When the tours and the buses and come through, <clears throat> if they don't have a daddy that ever was in the war, a grandpa, you know, you just don't know. They have no clue what's going on in here. But they'll look and see a fighter. They'll, I mean, uh, an aircraft, they see all these things and it's like, wow. They don't get that information as much as seeing, putting it in your hand, climbing in a tent, you know, and all these things here. So I just hope this is <coughs> keeps on becoming a, a more financial, a financial uh, uh, successful uh, and stays here forever.